Welcome, Atlas of Doom. Give it up for that, that very precise, concise introduction. <laughs> All right, we have had a technical breakthrough. So I see that uh, my crowd is significantly less than Kevin Johnson's crowd. That's OK. A lot of the people don't, don't overlap much in interest. Uh, so kind of putting on my Atlas hat again. This is jarring, trying to be Kevin first. Oh, yeah, that's right. We're going to talk about sub gigahertz wireless. Who here has ever used? Some radio thing that lives in the sub gigahertz range. Those of you who are informed, everybody else should have had their hands up. You have all used them. No, I'm not being a jerk. Just, it's true. Wait, you'll, you'll see. It's fun. So this started out back at ShmooCon with a talk about sub gigahertz radio, how it works, and how to play with it. Uh, it became a project that is extensible for your own magic, but is pretty magical in and of itself, uh, thanks due to a lot of help from some amazing people. If you, if you want to put a tagline on my grave, it is that I'm very good at surrounding myself with brilliant folk. Um, here's the trick. The magic of today's talk is that we get to fast forward I've given this talk in three other venues in different formats with different information as the project's grown, as the information's grown, and I've yet to complete it. It really is about a two and a half hour talk, or if you want to work in exercises, uh, it's a one or two day class, and I'm actually putting, it, putting together a class for Black Hat next year um, for their proposal. So what we're going to do is we're going to fast forward, and I, I scanned this last night and I thought, I can actually cut this talk in half and give the second half and not actually lose anything. It's a level of capabilities difference. The first half is about radio. It's about how it works, how to do things with RFCAT by extending it, doing code development. There are slides and videos of that given three times already. Although the first time is really sucky and, and the video cut off and it was bad. So, but DEF CON and Black Hat both have that talk. We're going to get to complete the talk and talk about how to actually play with RFCAT. The slides will be available. I'm going to have all of the slides available. So if you want to go back and look through these slides, they're all there too. There's value. What plays in the sub gigahertz range? This is a slide I do not want to skip. Everything. Your cell phones very likely live in the sub gigahertz range or split between 800, 900 megahertz, and 1.8 and 1.9 gigahertz. Your cordless phones. You probably don't have a 900 megahertz phone anymore, but they have been huge, and I like them better because they don't interfere with Wi-Fi. Car remotes. You've got uh, 433, 315. They, they love these ranges. Depends on where you're at in the world. Pink IMEs. That's a girl texting toy that we like to hack. Uh, I got a firmware for that that, uh, that we're going to talk about in a little bit. Medical devices. Medical devices have their own range set aside for them, but they live everywhere. Power meters. Hmm, who would ever want to know about that? Old TV broadcast lives under sub gigahertz range, and much, much more. This is the Wild West. We all know about Wi-Fi. We all know about uh, WiMAX somewhat. These are standards that use a particular band for a whole bunch of stuff. Sub gigahertz doesn't have a whole lot of standardized communications. Oh, there are standards. And some people claim to adhere to them, but they're wild, wild west. They, they don't implement anything in particular. So how do we play with it? Uh, my solution is called RFCAT. Uh, it started a few years back. I'll get into the history in just a few slides. but. Um, we will be talking largely about RFCAT today. Uh, Chipcon 1111 or the 1101 radio, 
is the generic way of saying RFCAT, only without the software piece. Why do we care? Uh, well, because I think that there's probably enough inner geek in this room to uh, fill an entire classroom of rocket science geniuses and still win. And now, to the fun part. So RFCAT, it stands for the Radio Frequency Chipcon-Based Attack Tool. I just like the name. I've been a Netcat fan for years. Uh, you might think of this as a sub-gigahertz radio redirector, if you will. We'll talk a little bit about the background, the goals, plans, and some of the stuff that we've done. I was working for some powerful people in the power industry for about three years. And uh, they said to me that my task was to, A, hack the snot out of power equipment before we stick it in the field so that we're not causing what amounts to basically a compromise that changes the face of the Western world, and B, scare the shit out of the vendors so that they get proactive about it, because they were awful. So in my early times with the power work, I went to a, a power industry a conference called Distributech, very common. Um, and I got to speak with some of the vendors that, some of which I was going to be testing and some of which didn't make the cut even to try testing. And some of the vendors, I won't tell you which camp they ended up in, but uh, one of the vendors had a conversation with me where they said, our frequency hopping spread spectrum radio is too fast for hackers to hack. I still stew on the levels and quantity of stupid in that statement. Uh, one, of the, one of the stupid things is, is, yeah, right, Let, let's put a challenge out there and then leave it. And the second stupid is hacking has nothing to do, well, the larger hacking has little to do with just taking over your communications. But if you're going to make it that easy, we'll rise to that bar. Problem was, there really wasn't any attack tools at the time that made this easy. So in my team, actually, the, uh, we worked really hard with some various tools to get to the level where we could prove their stupidity just to start the assessment. And so when I put together RFCAT, the intention was something that does not hack power meters out of the gate, but certainly can. And the idea is for the people who are in the industry doing good work to have a base where they have to stretch just a little bit to get something that will allow them to test the security. I don't want to lose power. I'm very dependent upon it. But therein lies the rub. So there's a bit of a, you know, how does this work that went into building our FCAT? I, I'm very interested in radio. I've, I've loved it since I was five years old and I learned about it. Um, but I really didn't do a whole lot with it. We did some Wi-Fi stuff. We did, you know, Kismet and, and all that stuff in the day. And, you know, we've had some, I've had some fun with some radio things, but there were, it's always been a, you know, if I could do this more, I bet you I could find some stuff to, to break that. Also, security analysis tools. Duh, let's, let's break into it and show to make better, right? You know, I love breaking things, and I'm not always the white hat, let's, let's publish everything, let's, let's work with everything. But in this regard, the better we can make our power system, the better my life will be. Also, just satiate my general love of radio frequency. Um, there was a, one of the earliest hacking stories comes from about 1903, when Marconi, you guys probably heard that name before, still a business today, very big in the, in the radio uh, world. But Giuliano uh, Ani Marconi was giving a demonstration of his, well, you might call it virtual private radio, because he was selling the fact that 
he could tune radios to a certain frequency, and only other radios tuned to that frequency could listen in or take part in that conversation. That was a big deal in 1903. The ability to tune radios has jumped huge amounts since then. But he was sitting at the top of a mountain with his transmitter, and his assistant was sitting in a crowd not unlike this one, with very intelligent people waiting to see Marconi's radio magic. Five minutes before the demonstration, a little ticking noise started becoming quite irritating, and it turned out to be coming from Marconi's device. Somebody in the audience, who here knows Morse code? All right, this dude in the audience starts thinking, wait, that sounds like Morse code. And soon it was very apparent that it was Morse code. It was actually Morse code saying the most derogatory things about Marconi and his tool because this person was able to break into the communications and take it over. Well, the assistant was infuriated and publicly outlashed at whoever it was in the newspaper. And within three days, Neville Maskelyne, a guy whose family was in the circus, and his interest in radio had to do with, well, circusy things, the magic of being able to guess who people are, for example, or information about them. Maybe, a, maybe an earpiece that has, a, that has a radio in it you can talk over. And Mescaline took Marconi's premise and said, that's wrong, and built a huge transmitter that broke into the system. He came up, came forward. He was very happy to. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that was me. And the assistant flamed him mercilessly. I mean, we, we're talking making the Unix list days look really kind of tame. And Neville's answer was, abuse is no argument. Marconi, who's far more reserved, says, I refuse to debate with, some, with one who would shine, cast doubt upon the technology or something along those lines. Something equally stupid. We know that now. Oh, here it is. I even wrote it down. I will not demonstrate to any man who throws doubt upon the system. Yeah. What? Those of you who saw the Shmukon talk a couple years ago, this is not Heady Attack, but the work and the, and the learning that we did in Heady Attack played into RFCAT greatly. My thought was, so Heady Attack helps us determine hopping frequency, uh, frequency hopping patterns, so then what? And my goal was to make a tool that I could then take those hopping patterns, put them into, and take over, and actually have a network adapter, not just some hacky toy. RFCAT has several different, uh, different faces, if you will. One is an interactive tool. Uh, I, I like to think of it as a Python interface to the sub gigahertz radio. Another is an RFCAT server. If you guys have ever done anything with, uh, uh, say, the Ravens, for example, there, there's, a, there's a tool called the RZ Raven, and it allows you to talk to uh, Zigbee radios from your Windows machine. Well, it, it's very common, and the Raven was no exception, to plug in the device, run a device driver that listens on a port, and then your application software just talks to that network port to uh, access the hardware. So RFCAT server attempts to do that because not everybody wants to, wants to write their toys in Python. I can accept that. Um, and sometimes standard in is not the greatest way to type in binary. All right, yes. RFCAT leverages the ChipCon 1101. I already mentioned that. TI basically said, pretty much everything we want to do in the sub gigahertz range, let's throw it all into one configurable radio instead of offering 10. And for the most part, this was the way that it, uh, this is the result of almost everything that they wanted to do. There are two exceptions, and one is, uh, some of the 
Zigbee work and some of the lower frequency Bluetooth work, they require a different physical layer, and so they weren't able to wrap that in. But they wrapped in amplitude shift key. That, that's better known as digital AM. They wrapped in frequency shift key, FSK, also known as digital FM. And several variations of these things that we know and love, only in the digital world. And they wrapped in a frequency range of upper 900 megahertz down to 300 megahertz with a couple gaps in the middle. Really good stuff. Um, when I made RFCAT, the goal was to make all of that available in as easy a fashion as possibly can. So uh, I'm a lover of IPython, interactive Python. It's my favorite shell. And I love the fact that I can debug processes with it. I can disassemble programs with it. I, I can do everything all from my little IPython command line shell. And so the research mode of RFCAT which is the most used and most tested and most stable, drops you to an IPython shell and creates an object for you to interact with, your US, uh, with the USB dongle called D. So you'll see a lot of commands in here that start with D dot, and that just means in the IPython environment, that's my object that I use to interact with that stuff. IPython's great, by the way. If you've never used it, it includes uh, some nice, pretty representation of information if you want to display it, and it includes one of my favorite parts, tab completion, in a very intelligent way, uh, so that I don't have to remember the API completely, I just type d.tabtab tab, and I get the list of the API. And you'll see down here, I've listed several very interesting things to do with the RFCAT dongle once you've got it set up. RFCAD server, I can't really see that very well. Basically, you start RFCAD server, and then you connect to it on port 1900 to get the interface to the wireless network. You then connect to it on 1899, and you get a command line interface where you get to configure the radio out of band. So if you want to tune it to a certain frequency, set up amplitude shift key modulation, and set the baud rate to 38.4 kilobaud, 38.4 kilobaud. You can do that from 1899. That will take effect in the other window, and you will have a connection with the network on that configuration. One of my favorite parts of the project actually is in the IME firmware that we built. Uh, it's called RF Sniff. Now, the RF sniff can also be used with a dongle, but RF sniff on, on the IME is special because the IME has a keyboard, and with that keyboard, we're able to set up all the radio frequency configuration parameters and change them at will. And then we can set up to either just send every packet or every bit of information that you sense on the network to the screen, or at least the first 30 characters of it, or filter based on some sync ID, which is very common for every different type of radio solution. Every, uh, every product that uses sub gigahertz, they typically will start off with some 16 or 24 bit sequence of bits that are just unique to that device. That way, the radio doesn't just send all sorts of solar noise and everybody's garage door opener and whatever to your uh, insulin pump. The insulin pump sits there and it's kind of like a MAC address. It says, okay, this, this is not meant for me, discard, this is not meant for me, discard. And it's all done in hardware very fast and it doesn't bog down the system. We're able to set up a sync ID in the RF sniff on the IME as well so that we only focus in on one thing. For example, I've got a power meter at home that I'm able to, I, I know what the sync ID is for it, and I'm able to tune in and catch every, with, R, with RF sniff, I'm able to catch every packet on the, on the particular channel I'm on. It doesn't support hopping at the moment, but, uh, but I'm able to catch every port that I'm listening on. And there's generally 52, 53 to 82 
different channels in any given hopping system. I list the key bindings here for, uh, for the RF sniff folk who want to take this offline and go play with it. It's also in a readme file in the project, but I wanted to make it simple and, and easily rememberable where you're at. Just wrapped in, in the last couple months, uh, I put in a spectrum analyzer. So we set a base frequency and then we set a channel width and then we set the number of channels up to 255 channels, uh, recommending about 100. And it scans through the channels very, very fast and it displays the power output at each one. So at the top, I'm using Python's use of floating numbers with the E symbol, but I could have just easily written 901000000, comma, 5, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, comma, 51, and that would be 51 channels of 50 kilohertz in spacing, starting at 901. And as you can see, I picked something up here at about 902. It's a little limited. It's not, uh, it's not production quality such as you might find in a $200,000 device. Still, it's not bad. I used to have to go, uh, Mike Osman. Anybody heard of Mike, Mike Osman? Amazing guy, very, very cool, knowledgeable and friendly. And uh, he wrote firmware for the IME that does spectrum analysis. And uh, so I used to always have one of those IMEs sitting around. I said, you know, this is silly. I'm going to probably give a talk and some, uh, and, some, um, and some courses on this. I should probably wrap that in and just make it happen since I've got the radio. Throughout the slides, you'll find that I've got exercises. I'm going to leave those to you. If you have an RF cat and you're interested, please go use the exercises. My email address is on the first slide. If you have troubles with the exercises, Drop me an email, let me know. But these, thing, these exercises drive home some of the key power components of RFCAT, including what I call low ball mode. Low ball mode is where you take, you remove, in the configuration, you remove all things that would not allow data to be transmitted to the screen or to your, to your buffer. What this does is effectively puts your, uh, your RF cat into quasi-monitor mode, if you will, if you remember the, uh, the days of uh, Kismet. Actually, the days. They're still kicking out awesome Kismet stuff. Um, if you want to print the uh, client state, the, the state of the, uh, the RF cat client, print wrapper client state. Once you have entered lowball mode, it stores the original configuration in your Python client. And then when you want to get out of lowball mode and go back to something more sane, you use lowball restore, and it copies the old config back into the radio, and everything takes off. And then you end up with being able to do RF receive. Everything that you get that comes in as a packet get stored in your Python buffer. So your radio isn't really even dependent at this point, or a dependency at this point. Your Python buffer stores it for you or for your application if you were writing something on top of RFCAT and you use RF receive to get at that data. This is an exercise, we'll actually cover this stuff in a few. Discover mode, oh, I'll get to that, sorry. I think my batteries are going dead. So some of the wicked coolness of RFCAT, I've already talked a little bit about it. We have, we have a, de a debug mode. If you want to see what the client is doing, talking to the radio, the Python client will actually offer up its goods if you set d dot underscore debug equal to greater than zero. It shuts up when you set it to zero. One gives you some sane messages, like I've sent these bytes to the radio, I've received these bytes to the radio, I use this a lot 
because it's really nice just when I'm troubleshooting or, or working on something, I'll set debug equal one, I will see exactly when I receive data from the radio without having to go do RF receive and print it out. The debug function sits and spins, printing out client information and the state of the radio at that point. So if you're, if you're running debug, for example, it will say, I've received this many packets for this, for this application. The dongle is still responding and it's in the idle mode or it's in receive mode, things like that. Discover. Discover allows us to set a lowball mode. Default is one. Zero means send everything, even if you don't see any rise in power in the radio. One is the more saying, hey, as soon as I see a carrier, just send data. I think that's the most helpful, which is why it's the default. But it then just sits and prints data as it, as it appears in a nicely packaged format that can make sense to you in hexadecimal. Lowball mode is used by Discover, and we already talked about it a little bit and low ball restore. RF listen is a step above discover, and it basically says, using this configuration, if I receive packets, just print them to, to the screen. It may seem like a small step up, and maybe I should have, you know, it seems confusing, but actually when you get into playing with it, you'll find that they both have their purposes. RF capture is basically RF listen, but it stores every packet so that at the end, when you hit enter and you get out of RF listen mode, it will return to you a list of the packets so that your program can chew on them. Scanning mode allows us to set a particular uh, base frequency, a channel size, and a timeout and it just sits and hops through all the channels looking for data. Spits it out on the screen up to a certain amount and then moves on. I found this can be very fun driving through town. Like, oh crap, what's that? I found that at 912 and 924 megahertz at my house, which is basically an RF cage, uh, I still have constant stream of data. No idea why yet, but I wouldn't have found it if I hadn't turned on a scan mode. Specan mode is how you turn on, uh, or d.specan is how you turn on the spectrum analyzer. Pops up a GUI, so it's a different window, and then when you close the GUI, you get your, your command line back. And d.printradioconfig prints out all the information that you could possibly want to, well, okay. Uh, most of the information that would be very good to know about how the radio is configured, what modulation, what speed, uh, what intermediate frequency, you can change the intermediate frequency for those of you radio buffs out there. And I went over this in the exercise already, sorry. Uh, one thing to note about discover mode, it doesn't just drop you into lowball mode. The idea behind the creation of discover mode was identifying sync words in the area. So this is shared spectrum, right? If, uh, if you want, if you're in a re relatively populated area, you'll probably always have no less than three devices hitting you at once for a lot of the channels. So the idea here is kind of like Kismet would show what networks were listening by listening for traffic and making sense out of them. Discover mode has a parameter you can turn on called ident sync word and it will assume that all this raw data coming through has a sync word on the front, and then a, uh, a, carrier will, will, uh, a carrier will come in, which is an alternating one and zero bit up to a certain length. That's how the radio knows that there's a carrier, by the way. This is called a preamble, and when the preamble is done, the sync word normally starts, and that's how uh, it knows that the start of the frame is about to occur. Discover mode takes that information that comes in, does some math, shifting around of the bits, and comes up with possible sync words. 
So this, this I use this actually on discovering my, uh, my power meter sync word and actually had some interesting stuff there I'll talk about in a minute. But does that make sense to everybody? So you get 10101010, that's standard preamble. Then your sync word starts after that. But who's to say that your sync word doesn't start with a one or a zero in the same sequence as the preamble? So discover mode says, this is something that I'm pretty sure could be, and then it shifts up and it includes up to most of the preamble and spits out the, uh, the options for each network that it identifies. If I'm looking for a list of sync words, I turn on sync word match list, hand in a list, a Python list, of the sync words that I'm looking for, and it looks for and discovers and prints out when, you, when it finds one. Not required, totally optional. Uh, a power meter that I was hacking has 16, 15 possible sync words based so that they can easily say, hey, this utility is using our stuff and this utility adjacent to it is using our stuff. Let's tweak it so that they don't get each other's messages. One tool to rule them all. I wish, that's the goal. Um, unfortunately, it's not totally the case yet, but it ruins the title of the slide. So I'm just gonna say one tool to rule them all and then throw in there, it may be a, a software to find radio if you're doing discovery work. But for radio, for the attack side of radio, RFCAT should do almost all that you need it to do for leveraging against sub gigahertz radio. So I will have a dongle called Gina running RFCAT SPECAN, the spectrum analyzer. Yes, I named my dongles. It's a great service. It's called a dongle naming service. Uh, dongle Paul, actually somebody stole Paul at Shmoocon, I'm a little missing him right now, but uh, Paul will be running RFCAT proper so that I can tweak everything right away and, and go find and sniff. Uh, I like an IME running RF sniff, um, especially when I'm developing because there's nothing worse than making a change and not knowing, okay, something broke, is it the transmitter or the receiver, and having just a known good sitting around. Uh, from the non-RFCAT part, a Solea logic analyzer is one of my best friends, and it allows me to tap into bus lines and communication between different chips on an RF board or on, a, on any embedded system and track the, uh, the ones and zeros on the bits. Did I just say the ones and zeros on the bits? Yes, on the wires, the bits on the wire. And a FunCube dongle or some other SDR, they're really cheap. A FunCube dongle is like 100, 180 bucks. Okay, it's not nearly as cheap as RFCAT. Um, if you're only interested in sniffing, which actually I am, I found that uh, some of the high performance video USB plugins have been turned into SDRs and they're like 20 bucks. So what this allows you to do is get a better picture at the lower levels of what a waveform actually looks like. And from that, it's easier to determine modulation scheme and baud rate. And it's kind of just a basic troubleshooting tool. I am pushing RFCAT to be more and more and more, but it'll never be an SDR. It just isn't. So on occasion, cranking up an SDR can make your research that much better. Put together a, an RF attack form. So for example, every device that I have, I'll sit down with a form and I've got it downloadable from the website. This is just a slide showing some of the information. Um, and I'll fill in the, just to make sure I'm answering all the questions that I have to before I sit down with a device and start to play with it. Base frequency, modulation, baud, bandwidth. This is your modem stuff. You guys remember the modems? Your deviation, how do I know uh, a deviation in the frequency that's a one or a zero. Channel hopping, how many channels, uh, pattern and effective sync method, because it's one thing to know a pattern of a system, it's another to figure out how they discover each other. 
Channel spacing, dwell period, this is how long it stays on every channel. And is it fixed or variable length? Variable length packet is well known, the first byte sets the length of the packet. Um, does it have an address? Or is it just some device that treats every other buddy as, as able to transmit to it? What's the sync word or sync words, if applicable? Does it use any encoding or uh, CRC, Manchester? These are all things that the radio handles for you. It's very handy to know that right out of the gate. We've recently added, and here's the, uh, the recon form on the website. We've recently added the ability to uh, turn on and use the hardware AES in the chip. Uh, I mean, it's always been available, but we've recently made it very easy to set it up and to use it. Uh, anybody heard of major malfunction? Major malfunction, amazing guy out of the UK. Uh, he is well known for his Bluetooth and Zigbee hacking. He works at a place called The Bunker. It's kind of scary. Um, but he's also been contributing to the RFCAT project, and he needed recently the, A the AES compatibility or capability. And so he's like, I know you're going to get this. It's on your to-do list here. And he handed it to me. It's another exercise. So a little bit of the application. How are we doing on time? It's 10, 10? All right, good. Warning, mucking around with medical devices, particularly insulin pumps, can be deadly. I personally have the ability to, uh, to push insulin through, uh, well, not push yet, but uh, to definitely set up a pump to push a lethal injection of, uh, of insulin. And so be warned, one of, my, one of my closest friends is a diabetic and he let me use his pump. So as I say, be careful. We found the PDF of the manual told us what frequency the thing operated at. And it's not a standard frequency. It's not even in the, uh, the range for medical devices. What diabetic cares what frequency their device runs on? Unless, of course, they're upset because they can't, I don't know. But I thought it was interesting. Um, the modulation is easily guessed just by the waveform. I used a, a spectrum analyzer, and I'm like, yeah, that's definitely blah. And no, I'm not going to tell you what it is. We used uh, several other techniques and tools, including a USRP. Uh, I was working on this last, last January, I believe. And Mike Osman was trying to give me a hand. And he said, wait a minute, you don't have a USRP? What do you, wow. So he sent me a USRP to, to help him help me. The discovery process, probably some of the most fun, uh, for pictures at least. We first started out with a spectrum analyzer between the radio module and the main board. And, uh, and we hit it with a spectrum analyzer, did I say? Sorry. We hit it with a spectrum analyzer first, watched the stuff, and figured out what we could by, by uh, using a spectrum analyzer. We then moved on to a logic analyzer, watching the data go over the, the data bus, the wires on the board. Then we captured basically audio data from a USRP and got a picture of what this waveform looks like, and from it, we were able to tell baud rate and sync word. Given the baud rate, the sync word actually turned out to be pretty easy. Um, we took the packet capture out of the USRP, because the RFCAT was in a much earlier state, and I wasn't able to, to do as much with it. Um, and we, turn, we put it into a tool called BODLINE. BODLINE did analysis and allowed us to figure out baud rate and visually look for data. Next, Mike Osman, and, and we were floundering here just a little bit. We, we went in several different directions. I'm telling you the I suck story, just, just so that you know 
that when, we're, when you're doing research and you go down a road and you're not sure if you should go down that road and so you try a different road and it turns out that you were able to cor uh, triangulate the, what you're after out of all these different things, that's not just you. It happens, every researcher has to deal with this and deal with the failure that you have to run into before success. So Mike Osman then took the, uh, the capture and ran it through GNU Radio Companion. You guys heard of GNU Radio? Okay. GNU Radio comes with a graphical tool that allows you to process, maybe demodulate, amplify, whatever, process raw radio and turn it into bits. And from that, we were able to determine uh, all the information that we needed. We pumped in the parameters into our FCAT, and we were able to receive directly from the, the uh, sender. This is just a little bit of collage work to show that I'm not a visual artist. Up here is what uh, the data looks like in Bodline, just so that if you ever do it, you've got something to compare against. This is all the junk that Mike had to go through to, uh, to work through GNU Radio Companion to demodulate and get out the data from this thing. Now you're starting to see the answer to the question, why don't you just use an SDR for this? Because that stuff's hard. And yeah, writing firmware from scratch is hard too, but I do it once. And if I make it flexible enough, I've not only got something where that allows me to do analysis, but also I've got the attack tool when I'm done. And right here you can see the scope with the preamble right here, the sync word right here, and then the data. So once we uh, hit the configuration into RFCAT, we started seeing, this is discover mode, we started seeing various forms, now, and don't forget, in discover mode you are either one bit aligned or two bit aligned, which means that the bytes could be all shifted all over. And we came up with possible sync words that are not very visible on this slide. And we just turned it on into normal NIC mode. And here's our packet. Turns out the medical devices, as well as many of the simpler radio devices, they don't have simple send and receive. A lot of them, including your garage door openers and your car key fobs and apparently insulin pumps, you run and they do 100 or 200 attempts and sends. Now, you may think this is because the transmitter's weak or problematic, but it turns out if you don't, even if you have a pristine packet that you're sure of, the pump doesn't do anything until it sees like 100. So the firmware probably does some statistical analysis saying, okay, we've just received like 100 packets. Errors occur a lot more than you'd think from our normal wireless experience. And so they throw out these aberrations. You know, we had five that are different and, you know, 100 or 95 that are the same. Need to reverse the pump for, uh, for actual the bidirectional protocol uh, or actually just how to get around it. I know that there's actually a way that I should be able to issue a command to the pump and just have it drop insulin into the channel. I'm not sure that I actually want to publicly present that. Um, I do know of a path to get there and I haven't had time. But I can register glucose levels of 475. If anybody knows glucose levels, that's pretty scary. Mucking with a power meter is illegal without permission from the utility company and probably their vendor, even if it's on the side of your house. Yes, you give them the right to manage this thing as a part of your property, even though you don't own it.
Now, power meters are just one component of a very large power system. The end, the last mile, if you will, is called the distribution. There's transmission on the outside of di the distribution bubble, and then there's generation on the outside of that. There's a lot more complexity to it, but think about those stages. Meters make up a large component of distribution in the monitoring, but also in distribution, all those meters have wire cables that connect back to a distribution substation. And distribution substations have SCADA equipment and cap banks and other things that help make your stuff more reliable and make their monitoring more accurate. Why do I say that? Because when I sat down with the guy originally talking about power meters, I said, okay, I've got these ideas. And he says, don't even bother with them. You're worried about stealing energy. I'm not. I said, okay, then what bothers you? He says, we're working with a system that is antiquated and the influence of enough power, which power meters with a disconnect switch have control over, to literally change the face of the Western world. I stole that phrase from him. And he went on to detail to me how controlling enough of the power through disconnect switches on power meters is enough to break things in the power in the bigger, more expensive side of, uh, of transmission and distribution that can have up to 18 month lead time to get a replacement and can cost well over a million dollars. He says, I don't want people to gain control of these things. Like, yeah, me neither, thanks. Many of the existing power meters use their own proprietary neighborhood area network, NAN, as it's called. And that is basically their meters all meshing together and talking to some access point, which then has some sort of backhaul, sprint, maybe lease line, whatever, back to the utility for control. There have been two phases of smart meters. Well, there have been two phases of special meters, if you will. One is called AMR. And I'm not really interested in AMR, there's no control there. It's just basically meters broadcasting their usage so that people can drive down the road and get the usage instead of going up and checking every meter. The second type is called advanced metering infrastructure, and it is intelligent bidirectional communication with power meters that have some uh, microcontrollers that do communication. So the ChipCon 1111, has the same ChipCon 1101 core that's in, I would say, 75% of the power meters available today. That's why I'm here. As I said before, uh, this stuff was voodoo, or taboo, sorry, and unavailable to security researchers. Uh, the power people are fear security research, stereotypically, historically. Some people are out there trying to make it better. Um, but It's become very plain in the last three years that there are some power vendors who want to take a proactive approach, engage the people smart enough to break their stuff, pay them, not threaten them, and then fix the problems and push out, you know, get, it, get a supply chain that actually can handle security updates. Some vendors do not, however, drink this Kool-Aid, but rather consider sticking their head in the sand the better way. Um, I typically, I, I have several power meters and I like to display them anonymously. I cover the faceplate and stuff uh, from a vendor who has been very good to me and to my co-security researchers. And their only, their only request is that we respect them to share the vulnerabilities with them and respect others not to share it publicly. These guys get it. They want to know how their baby's ugly. Um, I, I've really gotten a bad attitude about certain vendors. Power meters aren't as simple as glucometers. 
They typically are covering much larger distances. And in the industrial, scientific, and medical, the ISM bands, there are restrictions on how much power you can use for any one given device. There is an exception to the, to the limitation, however, that allows a significantly greater amount of power to be used if the devices hop over more than 50 channels and not spend more than a certain amount of time on any one channel in a 20 second period. These are the FCC rules. Uh, ITU has rules that cover a lot of uh, you know, the world, but the FCC applies this to us. So what we're finding out is that instead of just, or what we found out was instead of just grabbing packets, we have to hop along with, which means we have to identify a frequency hopping pattern, and we have to identify a discover mode, not just for one meter vendor, but we have to do it for every meter vendor because they're all different. There's some standardization that, that looks like it could make this easier because uh, they at least publicize everything but I've actually found that a lot of the guys doing cutting edge work, they've patented their stuff. And so their Mac and Fi is publicly available. In fact, the vendor that I was talking about, who still wishes to remain anonymous, sadly, has said, we've decided overtly to publish, to publish our Mac and Fi layers because we can't allow them to be seen as our security. Not a bad idea. So as time permits, I certainly hope to knock down several more vendors to have RFCAT talking with them, but I won't publish, so I'm sorry. But if you're in the industry, I will talk to you. We won't be syncing with the meter today. Uh, I didn't bring it, but uh, also just because I don't want that part of my talk. So we start off with the uh, SPI bus sniffing using the logic analyzer. And as you can see, the logic on certain pins bounces up and down periodically. On an SPI bus, we have a clock, and that is this guy down here. And then we get the data in these other, these other wires. SPI has a to and from wire, so that instead of just a back and forth, we know that this is data coming to the device, and this is data coming from the device. Yes, this is actually just video or pho photographic digital porn because yeah, I'm not really showing you the data. There we go. So we take that data, we shove it through some, I some Python parsing goodness. We end up being able to read what the data is sent to the radio including configuration settings, channel hopping parameters. I had to write a special client for this, but it turns out that this particular 900 megahertz radio, the radio is set to work at 400 megahertz. And it doesn't hop. You can understand my confusion. Turns out they're heterodyning their 400 megahertz radio signal who here knows heterodyning? Okay, you guys all have a super heterodyning radio, very likely, uh, or have in the past. Heterodyning means that you mix two signals and you get two output signals with one base signal and then plus or minus the other signal on either side. So what we were seeing was we had a 400 megahertz radio and then they were doing their hopping on a secondary device, which they changed channels. Secondary device operates at 1.3 gigahertz, which lands us right in the 900 megahertz range. So just reversing this hardware was rather odd, but you know, this is the types of things that you can see in an embedded space. We hit discover mode. And we didn't see anything of interest until I realized in the process of the mixing, they're flipping the bits so that every one is a zero and every zero is a one. 
And so as I'm looking for a sync word, 1010101, which is actually AA in the byte, hexadecimal AA. But then at the end of 5555, which is 01010101, the reverse, I have this weird thing that when I invert those bits, happens to be one of the uh, one of the sync words that I'm looking for. The discovery process is painful. Sometimes, but that's why I'm sharing so that if you play, you can uh, you can have it less painful. Recently, as I said, several vendors have filed numerous patents, or their FCC filings are not private. Uh, there's a thing you can do when you submit your system to the FCC where you can request that certain parts of it is confidential and they won't share it publicly. Um, one of the vendors has done this very well except for one thing that gives away their Mac and Fi still. Uh, and here are some patents to a Mac and Fi layer that need some attention if you're interested. Abuse is no argument. We are responsible for ensuring that our world is secure, particularly the stuff that we depend on. Your friend may be the first insulin-related hack death. Your power may get turned off by someone who's played around with the power equipment. It is our job to ensure that vendor claims are proven true. Thank you very much.